How are we doing everybody? Uh, so as I promised, I wanted to do a video really breaking down why I feel like temperament is such an important aspect to what we're doing as breeding snakes. And also why it's such an important aspect to picking out your pet snake or uh, picking out snakes to go into your breeding projects. Now I know a lot of people out there are probably not going to like this video because there's a lot of people that produce animals that quite honestly suck temperament wise and so from their perspective they want to sell you on this whole thing well a snake's a snake let a snake be a snake and da 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 which to a point is true I do obviously feel and I've, I've gone over in previous videos that we do want to treat our snakes as snakes understand things from their perspective and use that in tailoring how we're setting them up how we're keeping them how we work with them but why can't we have a better class of animal? And so what I'm gonna do is kind of define a little bit what temperament is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how temperament in other species has kind of affected the physical appearance of these animals as well as creating more reliable animals behaviorally. Uh, and so I think the first thing that we should do is define what temperament is. And temperament is a person or animal's nature uh, especially as it permanently affects their behavior. And I want you to listen to that word permanently. So a lot of us talk about the fact that nature versus nurture and that we can raise these animals in a certain way. And if you handle them enough, you're going to fundamentally change that animal. And that's not the case. Temperament is permanent, meaning it is always going to be whatever that personality is. Now we can affect how that animal interacts with us, how it interacts with its environment, and all of these things, and that is a part of raising these animals. But no matter what you do, that permanence is always there. So if an animal is high, strong, and defensive, it could have a 10-year run where it's really good, but all of a sudden it gets a little sick or a little stressed out, or maybe you move to a new place or it switches to a new home. Uh, something happens to you and you have to have a friend or family member come in and take care of your animals in those situations where now that animal has new stress or is tipped over the balance of what it can handle for stress, it is going to default back to its personality, to its temperament. And so if you start out with an animal from the beginning with a better temperament, then you're not gonna run into as many problems down the road or potential problems. Now, nothing is 100% guaranteed, so this doesn't mean you can't have a really well-tempered animal turn south, and it doesn't mean you can have a really ill-tempered animal not make a great pet. Um, nothing is ever absolute like that, but over the course of time and looking at the numbers and the statistics, the better tempered animals you have from the beginning, uh, the better experience you're going to have overall. And so I think that's really important, and I think as breeders, it is our job to breed animals that are going to handle captivity better. And what handles captivity better? A high, strong, nervous, defensive animal? Or an animal that's calm, cool, collected, and lets stuff roll off their back? You tell me. I think it's obvious. Uh, some people want to argue and, and say the, the you know counterpoint, but I feel like the only reason they're saying those counterpoints is it's better for what they're doing and better for sales and marketing for them. I don't think it's the truth. I think it's just something they tell you. Same with the people right now that try to tell you, oh, don't worry about the snake market. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Sales are great over here. And the same people that are telling you sales are great over there have the same snakes on Morph Market for 15 months. So if sales are so great, why are those animals not moving? And now I'm not telling you that we're in panic mode or anything like that. We're getting off topic here. But it just really pisses me off to see people lying to hope that it makes them a sale. They're not telling you that because they're looking out for you. And the same with people that are telling you panic, 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 sell everything. That's that's not founded either. I mean, these things are cyclical and the, the economy and all these things going on in the world is going to affect this niche as well. We're not immune to that. Uh, so I don't want to dive into that, but let's let's get back on, on track here. So one thing I want to talk about, which we're going to go into more uh, with domesticated animals, because obviously domesticated animals have been bred in captivity a little bit longer and more consistently than snakes have. So snakes, to me, a lot of them are very, very close to fitting the definition of domestication, which is basically, you know, you're, you're breeding an animal for specific physical traits, for specific purposes, uh, for living better with people. 
And if we really start focusing on temperament, then isn't that going to basically flip that switch into domestication? Which, if these animals were to be classified as domesticated in what we're doing with them, that would help us a lot in the legal aspect because a lot of the legal stuff with all these programs and things that they're doing always talks about wild animals versus domesticated animals. And domesticated animals are often left off of this stuff because of what it would affect economy, agriculturally, all those things. And so getting these animals to that status to me would actually be beneficial to the animals as well as ourselves. It gives them a little bit more protection, gives us a little bit more protection. But anyhow, so domestication syndrome um, is basically something that they coined this term for because when we've been breeding cattle, we've been breeding camels, we've been breeding cats, dogs, all these animals in captivity for many years, we start to notice a pattern of changes physically in these animals. And now we ask ourselves, why is this happening? Well, what we're doing when we're breeding for temperament is basically we are looking to reduce an animal's flight or flight or uh, fight or flight response. So typically a wild animal, you come up upon that animal, it has to make a split second decision. Do I need to fight and defend myself or should I run and protect myself that way? And over the course of time, these animals obviously learn which things to fear, which things are food, whatever. But a lot of that is ingrained in their mind from the day they're born. Uh, the, the fight or flight stuff is, is very much a genetic thing that goes on inside their body. And so as we've been breeding animals, we've been slowly removing the fight or flight response to get them to be more comfortable living with us who are essentially a predator to them. And in some cases, maybe something they would look at as prey. Uh, so most of these domestic animals share um, a bunch of common traits. So obviously friendliness to humans, which is what our goal is in domesticating animals. We want them to be comfortable living with us. Uh, but they also share a lot of physical traits. So they tend to have floppier ears. So when you look at a lot of dogs now, you know, wolves ears are always pointed straight up. A lot of our dog breeds now have floppy ears, and even the breeds that have ears that are standing up, a lot of those are cropped now to get them back to a more natural appearance. Uh, but by and large, most of our dogs have floppier ears, and uh, you know, same with cattle and all these other animals that, that we've domesticated. They often have shorter snouts now. If you look at a wolf snout compared to a lot of dog breeds, a lot of dog breeds now have a, a more pushed in or narrow, smaller snout than that longer wolf snout uh, when you look at them. They often have a spotted coat or spotting. We see less uh, melanistic traits in a lot of these animals, um, or at least less consistency with it. Uh, so you look at like uh, dairy cows, very spotted. Um, you look at natural wild cows, they don't look like that. So it's not that we have selectively bred those animals for those physical appearances, that is more of a side effect of what we've been breeding for, which is the, the fight or flight response to get rid of that. And so um, you might ask yourself, why did these changes in physical appearance happen when we're isolating and trying to work on something else? And so basically what happened is something called neural crest cells. And this is what they're looking into now to, to determine basically what they call domestication syndrome and why it's happening. And uh, syndrome makes it sound like it's a bad thing. And it, it, it can be to a point, um, you know, you, anything you do to change something is going to have other effects that weren't necessarily intended. That's just kind of the way nature is. And that's because in this case of these neural crest cells. So these neural crest cells are a type of stem cell, uh, meaning that as animals are developing in the womb or, or whatever it is that they're developing in, uh, these cells differentiate into more specialized cells that um, you know become parts of the body as well. So they contribute to the development of like the, the adrenal medulla, which is an adrenal gland in the brain. And that's what controls your, your fight or flight is, is that. And so as we've been reducing that, well, it turns out that that changes some of these physical characteristics. And so by us picking less fearful animals to breed together, uh, we're getting a less developed adrenal gland or medulla. And therefore those cells also um, basically reduce the melanin in a lot of animals. 
Uh, they also control cartilage development, which is why you're getting those floppier ears, because now you have less of that development in there, and so the ears start to fold over instead of standing erect. Um, you know, so it's it, um, really, really interesting to look at this stuff and see how breeding for temperament has changed the physical aspects of the animal. And so then it brings the question in, how will that translate to snakes? And so what is connected within the snake's body and the snake's cells when we start to focus on temperament? What are we going to change over time? Are we going to see a shortened snout in snakes? Are we going to see different colors and patterns? And so it opens up a whole new world for us. You know, a lot of us have been so focused on physical appearance and things that we don't even know really what the capability is if we were to line breed for personality instead of line breed for just physical look alone. And that doesn't mean you can't pick the animals with better personalities and the best physical looks. Um, you know, you've really got to kind of go through and determine determine that. But I think if you make temperament a focus, we are going to make animals that are going to live in captivity better, that are going to be better pets, that are going to handle the ups and downs of a captive environment better, the stress that comes with it and is inherent to what we do. Um, you know, even on a small level, going in to clean your snake's cage and touching your snake creates stress. And the better balance that animal is and the less fight or flight that's built into that animal, the less stress that's going to create. And we know that stress is something that kills everything, including ourselves. Overstressed animals over time break down easier. Their immune response is less. So if we can start creating animals that are less apt to be stressed, then the logic dictates that they're going to be healthier animals in the long run. And so who doesn't want healthier animals with better longevity? Now, is that a guarantee that that's going to happen? No, but I think the common sense is there. And until we really focus on this and try, we can't eliminate that possibility at all. Um, now, the interesting thing about these cells is that if you were to shut down these cells completely, it would be fatal. These animals wouldn't survive. So all you can do is reduce that. So there's always some part of that that instinct that's still going to be there and present in these animals if they're living and thriving. Uh, but it's really interesting that over the course of time, we can genetically control this stuff. And now you can get scientists on different ends of the spectrum that feel different ways about this, but the general consensus is that 20 to 60% of our personalities is determined at birth. And we have no, nothing that happens in our life is going to change what that base personality type is. Now with us, a bit more of our experiences can mold the rest of that or contribute to parts of it, uh, which is why it's not just solely, you know, controlled at the genetic level. But we don't know how that's going to translate to snakes. We're not reptiles. They're slightly different. Um, but basically, when we're doing science, if we don't know something, we look at what we do know and try to find commonalities. And then we look to either prove or disprove that stuff. Now, I can say with 100% certainty that temperament is absolutely genetic on some level because I have focused on it in my projects the last several years and I'm now having seasons full of babies where I might have one or two defensive babies and the rest are fantastic pretty much right out of the egg or within that first couple of weeks once they settle in. And so if we weren't able to do that, then me specifically focusing on this stuff would not be giving me the streamlined results that I'm getting. Um, and like I said, there's, there's always one or two. I've got one that's labeled bitch over here for when my friends come over and have to watch stuff while I'm away uh, because she is the one baby that will absolutely railroad you in this house. She has no problem biting. Every other baby tub you see here, no problems. I can reach in, take anybody out. Doesn't mean on a given day that something might not strike because you might not catch it off guard or it's fearful or it's looking for food or whatever. But by and large, I can handle those babies. I can take them outside. I can take them into different situations that they're not used to and they're not reacting adversely. They might freeze a little bit, get more nervous, but they're not hitting that wall of fight or flight because I've been specifically breeding for several years now to try to get rid of that. Um, and obviously the stuff I'm making looks very nice, so I'm not affecting the appearance in a negative way. Um, the animals every generation that I'm producing are getting prettier and prettier because I'm also you know, selecting what I like physically uh, for my breeding projects, but I'm letting temperament be at the forefront and not take a back seat. And so that's what this video is about. So now we're going to dive into a little bit more. We've touched on some of it, but I want to really dive into depth into how this is going to affect the captive environment. So stay tuned.